endocarditis is really important because endocarditis has a good microbiological tie-in. So we're going to go into a little bit more microbiology along with endocarditis. 50-year-old male with history of bicuspid aortic valve presents to the emergency department with severe tiredness. The patient is noted on exam to be tachycardic and febrile. He has a new blowing holosystolic murmur best heard at the cardiac apex. Most likely infective organism underlying this patient's symptoms. So on the USMLE, the key thing that you have to note is that how is endocarditis going to present? A fever plus a murmur. That's how endocarditis presents, fever plus a murmur. And so Staph aureus is going to be the most common cause of acute infective endocarditis. So a good morphology tie-in, what is the morphology of Staph, Staph aureus? That is going to be a gram-positive cocci that is catalase positive and coagulase positive as well. The treatment, if you have MSSA um, uh, uh, staph is going to be NAF, at, ox, or decloxacillin, nafcillin, oxacillin, or decloxacillin. And what the mechanism of action of these penicillins are is that they are a penicillinase resistant penicillin, especially these amino penicillins, and they block diala diala cell wall synthesis by blocking the transpeptidase crosslinking. And this transpeptidase crosslinking makes the cell wall of the bacteria. Okay, so that's the key mechanism as to how these MSA sensitive antibiotics are going to work. So MRSA is the more scary one. What antibiotics are going to cover MRSA? The key one that we think about is vancomycin, right? So vancomycin, the mechanism of action is that it inhibits cell wall peptidoglycan formation by binding diala diala portion of the cell wall precursors. And it is going to be bactericidal against most agents. However, bacteriostatic against C. diff. Vancomycin also causes red man syndrome, so watch for that USMLE presentation. Daptomycin, okay? The key thing for daptomycin that you need to know is that daptomycin you do not use for lung infections because their surfactant is going to inhibit the um, antibiotic penetration. The side effect of daptomycin is going to be myopathy, so you can think about dabbing and that causing muscle damage. Linazolid also covers MRSA. Linazolid is going to inhibit protein synthesis by blocking the 50S subunit, okay? And that is going to be important in initiation complex. So what are the key antibiotics that inhibit the 50S subunit? Let's synthesize them. Chloramphenicol, clindamycin, erythromycin or macrolides, and linazolid. So cell, C-E-L, cell. The side effect of linazolid is going to be thrombocytopenia. Ceftaroline also covers MRSA. Ceftaroline is going to have a broad coverage and it is going to cover not only MRSA but enterococcus as well. However, ceftaroline does not cover pseudomonas. So the USMLE wants you to know what are the vascular and the embolic phenomena of infective endocarditis. So this is a good table for you to keep in mind. Infective endocarditis could be due to local cardiac in infiltration. Infective endocarditis could be due to bacteremia. Some of the things that you can see are vascular phenomena or you can see immunological phenomena. The vascular phenomena are going to be the, these embolized and aneurysms that the infective endocarditis um, can cause, as well as Janeway lesions. And Janeway lesions, key buzzword in terms of the vascular phenomena. Osler's nodes are going to be pa uh, painful, uh, painful uh, nodes that are going to be on the palms, okay? So ouch, ouch, Osler, that's an immunological phenomena, and rot spots are going to be found in the eye. What is the most common valve implicated in endocarditis? Most common valve implicated in endocarditis? That's going to be the mitral valve. So what would be in a question for a right-sided endocarditis? In right-sided endocarditis on your USMLE, there you're going to have what? A patient who has IV drug abuse, exactly. What heart lesion is most common in predisposing acute endocarditis? That is going to be mitral valve prolapse. How is mitral valve prolapse described on your USMLE? Well, a mid-systolic click. We talked about uh, mitral valve prolapse, what makes it louder, but remember the description, mid-systolic click. 
Rheumatic heart disease is the most common underlying cause in developing countries, but here we think about mitral valve prolapse. So here you have an immigrant with history of rheumatic heart disease presents with a two-week history of fatigue. She has been having low-grade fevers, and on exam, you notice a heart murmur along with petechiae under the nail bed. What is the likely diagnosis? Remember, this isn't an acute phase, right? Two weeks of these moldering symptoms, you're going to be thinking about subacute bacterial endocarditis. It's this indolent course rather than acute onset. So subacute bacterial endocarditis, the USMLE can put something like dental surgery plus a fever plus a murmur, okay? Dental surgery is a good buzzword with sub, uh, bac uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis. And what they want you to know with the dental surgery is that mouth flora is going to come and penetrate the heart. So you have strep viridans, okay? And in strep viridans, the dextrans are going to adhere, uh, the dextrans which adhere to the tooth enamel are going to cause these fibrate platelet aggregates, especially on the heart. The USMLE puts abdominal surgery or on hemodialysis plus the subbacterial endocarditis picture. If you think about abdominal surgery and hemodialysis, they want you to answer enterococcus. And that's really important for you to know. Okay, so enterococcus is a group, uh, group D uh, strep. It's catalase negative and it is described as gram positive cocci in pairs and chains. What about mechanical valve plus this clinical picture of subacute endocarditis? That's going to be staph epi, exactly. Mechanical valve, you're going to be thinking about staph epi. So, what is the biochemical characteristic of staph? strep viridans and staph epidermidis. Well, strep viridans and staph epidermidis, strep viridans is catalase negative and alpha hemolytic, whereas your um, uh, strep viridans will also cause this green zone of hemolysis on blood auger. Staph epidermidis, on the other hand, that is not catalase negative, that is catalase positive and coagulase negative. So that's how you can tease both of these out on your USMLE. So just a brief thing about staphylococcus, the USMLE microbiology tie-ins, staphylococci are going to be catalase positive, staph aureus is coagulase positive, staph epidermidis and staph saprophyticus are coagulase negative, and what differentiates epidermidis from saprophyticus? Epidermidis and saprophyticus both coagulase negative, but what differentiates them is going to be staph epidermidis is novobicin sensitive, whereas staph saprophyticus is novobicin resistant. So when you're thinking about somebody who has a fever plus a murmur, what are going to be the next best steps that you're going to do? Fever plus a murmur should prompt you to say what? Get a blood culture and get an echocardiogram, okay? So if the blood culture doesn't isolate one of these organisms that we're talking about, be it staph, be it enterococcus, etc., what if the blood culture is going to be negative? Then you're thinking about these HASEC organisms. HASEC organisms cause you to have neg uh, uh, culture negative endocarditis. Haemophilus, actinobacillus, cardiobacterium, iconella, and kingella. Echocardiography is going to be another good step for you to take because you want to look at the vegetations on the valves. So physical exam findings, non-tender lesions on the palms and soles. What are we thinking about in endocarditis? These are the Janeway lesions, and this is a vascular phenomena. And what about tender nodules on the, on the fingertips? That's going to be your Osler nodes, and those are your immunological phenomena. What about the hemorrhagic lesions on your ophthalmological exam, everybody? Rot spots. spots. Excellent. Excellent. Good. A patient with yellowing of skin diffusely that has progressed with weight loss. She is a smoker and rapidly decompensates. Sterile valvular vegetations made of platelets and fibrin are found on the surface of the mitral valve. What is the likely mechanism here? Well, this patient is likely having a hypercoagulable state from a mucin-producing tumor. When you're thinking about painless jaundice, what are we thinking about? Pancre pancreas cancer, right? Painless jaundice, we're thinking about pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is going to cause you to have a hypercoagulable state, and this hypercoagulable state is, can cause you to have platelet and fibrin depositions on the mitral valve. This is going to also be related to the hypercoagulable state of Trousseau syndrome. Trousseau syndrome is this migratory thrombophlebitis, and it's the same pathogenesis as what we just talked about. How about this vignette? A young female presents with joint pain. It is found that she has double-stranded uh, positive DNA and positive Smith antibody. What are we thinking of here? Yeah, exactly. Exam shows holosystolic murmur at the apex. Echo shows vegetations. What is going to be the likely diagnosis here? 
This is going to be Libnin Sachs endocarditis. And Libnin Sachs endocarditis is going to be in a lupus patient. Okay? Lupus patients also can have what particular heart presentation? Pericarditis, because lupus is an inflammatory disorder. So you can get this cirrhosal inflammation in lupus. So again, let's go systems-based when we're talking about lupus because it's a multi-system disorder. The CNS presentation is going to be some things like fever, cognitive dysfunction. You can get seizures from lupus. Cardiovascularly, we talked about the pericarditis, the Libman Sachs endocarditis. Respiratory-wise, what can you get with lupus? Well, you can get pleurisy and effusions with lupus. The renal manifestations for lupus, this is really high yield because renal failure is really um, a common cause of death in lupus patients. Membranous glomerular nephropathy, and that's going to be the nephrotic presentation. And key buzzword with membranous is spike and dome appearance. Whereas the nephritic presentation is diffuse proliferative glomerular nephritis, and that's these capillary wire loop or what they call wire lupus. The heme presentation of lupus is going to be anemia of chronic disease because of the chronic inflammation. Watch for your elevated ferritin. And you can also get thrombocytopenia, okay? But the interesting thing is that with the thrombocytopenia, typically have something called lupus anticoagulant, and you can actually get thrombolic events from antiphospholipid antibodies. So that's really important for you to know on your USMLE. Not only thrombocytopenia, but leukopenia. And MSK-wise, they're going to get migratory arthritis. The skin changes people really key in on because it's, it's a good clue that the patient has lupus. And that's this butterfly rash and photosensitivity. And what is the rheumatological associations like we talked about in the last slide? ANA, which is going to be a sensitive marker. However, your more specific ones are anti-double-stranded DNA and anti-Smith. A young male presents with fatigue and lower extremity swelling. He has had a runny nose and cough a week ago. He has rails on exam and a palpable liver edge. An infectious etiology is suspected as patient has a lymphocytic predominance on the CBC. Lymphocytic predominance, we think more about viruses. So what is the likely pathogen? The pathogen is going to be Coxsackie B. Coxsackie B causes viral myocarditis. It can also cause this dilated cardiomyopathy, and thus you can get increased end systolic and end diastolic volumes. And when you're talking about a dil dilated cardiomyopathy, watch for the S3 gallop on your physical exam. Pathology, when we're talking about viral myocarditis, is going to be lymphocytic infiltration into the myocardium. And other pathologies that we think of causing viral myocarditis are going to be adenovirus, parvovirus B19, diphtheria, and remember, this is a very important mechanism for diphtheria, and group A strep. And group A strep causes myocarditis because of antigen mimicry. What medication can cause myocarditis? This is a really interesting one, and that is going to be clozapine. And what clozapine does is that it decreases your neutrophil count, and because you are immunosuppressed a little bit, that can cause you to get myocarditis. An immigrant woman has been lost to follow up with her primary care doctor. Uh-oh. She has a history of diastolic murmur with associated SNAP, and today she is in the ER with focal neurological deficits. What is the likely mechanism behind her stroke-like symptoms? Well, this patient had a history of rheumatic fever. Remember, you can get mitral stenosis, and that mitral stenosis can cause you to have stasis in the top portion of the heart, and this can embolize to the brain, okay? And so watch for a patient who has a clot in the heart, and that embolizes to the brain. On JVD pressure tracing, what would mitral stenosis show? An increase in A wave. Remember, atrial fibrillation caused a absent A wave, but this one, because the top portion of the heart has to work so hard to overcome that stenotic region, you are going to get an increased A wave. So what's the most common cause of mitral stenosis? It's going to be rheumatic heart um, disease. And that's related to beta hemolytic strep infections. The pathology is going to show granulomatous heart nodules, and that's these ash-off bodies. And what is the likely gross pathological finding, not microscopic? That's going to be the com uh, commissural uh, fusion of the mitral uh, leaflets, kind of like a fish mouth appearance. All right, guys, hang in there. A patient presents with abnormal, involuntary jerking movements. He has a history of sore throat nine months prior. What is the likely area of the brain which may be affected? So what are we talking about with these dancing-like movements and we're talking about rheumatic fever? We're thinking about your what? 
Sydenham's chorea, good. And that's due to an autoimmune destruction of the basal ganglia. And what happens is, is that they are going to cross-react with the M protein and the brain parenchyma. So that's the mechanism behind Sydenham's chorea, and it's really important for you to know for your USMLA that Sydenham's chorea is going to be one of your Jones criteria. So let's talk about strep. The two organisms related to beta hemolysis when we're talking about strep is going to be group A strep or strep pyogenes and group B strep or strep A galactiae. How do you tell pyogenes and A galactiae apart? Well, they are going to be, um, strep pyogenes is going to be bacitracin sensitive, whereas your A galactiae or group B strep is going to be bacitracin resistant. Excellent. Remember, all streptococcus are going to be catalase negative. A 24-year-old male presents with stabbing chest pain. He had URI one week prior and states his chest pain is worse when he takes a deep breath. Oh, it's so much worse. What is the histopathological finding behind the likely diagnosis? The histopathological finding behind the likely diagnosis. That's going to be fibrinous necrosis. And fibrinous necrosis is the pathological um, uh, finding for pericarditis. The physical exam is going to note a friction rub when we're talking about pericarditis, and it's described as a high-pitched and leathery, scratchy sound. The chest pain is going to improve when leaning forward in pericarditis. The patient returns with same presentation over the next few years. And now, on his exam, he is notable for an early diastolic sound that is high in frequency. Early diastolic sound that is high in frequency. What is a physical exam finding? That is going to be a pericardial knock. And this pericardial knock is related to chronic pericarditis, okay? And pericardial knock can cause you to have an earlier S3 sound and can also cause you to have pulsus paradoxus. So what is pulsus paradoxus? Pulsus paradoxus is going to be a drop in systolic pressure by 10 during inspiration. Okay? And chronic pericarditis can cause you to end up having that inflammation and subsequent pericardial knock on physical exam. A 56-year-old male with history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia is admitted to the CCU. Three days prior, the patient was in the emergency room for chest pain, elevated cardiac enzymes, and ST segment elevations in leads V3, V4, and V5. He now has sharp chest pain with low-grade fevers. He is tachypnic. What is the likely mechanism going on here? Well, this patient is going to have a post-MI pericarditis. Post-MI pericarditis is related to this transmural necrosis that is activating the infl inflammation at that area and causing a fibrinous necrosis. So what's the difference between post-MI uh, pericarditis and Dressler syndrome. And it's all about time period. Dressler syndrome is going to be three to six weeks, whereas the post-MI pericarditis is going to be a little bit earlier. Dressler syndrome is going to be more of an autoimmune phenomena as well. And then when we're talking about treatment, we are thinking about decreasing inflammation, so aspirin or NSAIDs.